Hey everyone, how's it going? Today I want to start off by talking about the concept of a variable wing. Typically on aircraft you see fixed wings, wings that stay the same no matter what. There are different wing sizes and shapes, and these have different pros and cons. Some planes have wings at the top of the fuselage for better stability. Some planes have wings that are really long and thin, giving them what is known as a high aspect ratio, which means that they generally have reduced drag at the wingtips because they're so small. And some planes have delta wings, good for maneuverability and supersonic speeds. With there being a wide variety of benefits you can get from different wing types throughout the history of aircraft design, some have tried to design aircraft with wings that can change their shape and position for different situations. Today we can see this most commonly on jet fighters that were produced from around the 1950s to the 1970s, with planes like the F-14 Tomcat, the MiG-23, and the Su-24. These variable wing designs all generally followed the same so-called swing wing idea, where the wings could be rotated outward for a more standard wing configuration, or tucked in to create a more delta wing design. However, I want to take a look at a different variable wing. Instead, I want to look at a design that I think was a bit more radical. One that, instead of changing the wing's position, change the width and thickness of the wing at the pilot's will. The plane that I'm talking about is the NIAI RK-1. The story of this plane begins back in the 1930s in the Soviet Union. Around this time, aircraft designers in the USSR and around the world began to show interest in the idea of variable wings. An example of this can be seen in France in 1931 with the Mac-10, a plane that could expand or retract its wings to different lengths. Back in the Soviet Union in 1930, the NIAI, which roughly translates to, in English anyway, Scientific Test Aero Institute, was created and several different aircraft designers were given their own personal teams to create new innovative aircraft designs. This leads us to a man by the name of Grigory Ivanovich Bakshaev. He decided to design his own take on a variable wing aircraft, and by 1937, a Finnish prototype simply known as the RK was finished and flown. This initial design would serve as a proof of concept for his later design, proving the theoretical benefits of his wing concept. His concept was that on takeoff and landing, large telescoping wing sections would be extended over these more standard affixed wings, extending out to about the midpoint of the wing. This would give the plane a greater wing area, meaning it would ideally have a larger lifting surface and a shorter takeoff as a result. Once the plane took off, the pilot could then retract the wing sections back into the fuselage, making the plane have thin long wings which are typically better for planes at cruising speed, as the thin wings would typically have less drag. On its test flights in 1937, it was found that the telescoping section significantly assisted the plane on both takeoff and landing. The takeoff roll, or the time and distance needed for the plane to take off, was 250 meters and 14 seconds when the telescoping sections were retracted. With them fully extended, the takeoff roll was reduced to 135 meters and 9 seconds, a very impressive and significant decrease. It was also found that the telescoping sections could be easily extended and retracted mid-flight, so overall the RK was a major success in this proof of concept. The success of this idea led to Mr. Bakshaev expanding the idea, adding high speed into the equation. The original RK was rather slow, so it was decided that they needed to make it fast so it could actually be a military aircraft. The RK, as a result, would evolve into what was known as the RK-800, and later the RK-1. The RK-800 was named as such because the intention for it was to be able to reach speeds of 800 kilometers per hour, or about 497 miles an hour. In this new design, the two more standard wings were replaced with four smaller and thinner wings. 
On takeoff and landing, the telescoping wing would fully extend over both wing sections out to the wingtips, more than doubling the total wing area. The RK-800 would use just a single M105 engine with 1,100 horsepower for its thrust. Initial analysis of the design by Soviet experts approved of the overall design, but still did not expect it to be able to reach 800 kilometers per hour, but rather 780 kilometers per hour. Then, in late 1938, Soviet leader Joseph Stalin became very interested in the project, which led to a government order that the most powerful engine the Soviet Union possessed should be the engine for the RK-800. This order, along with redesignating the RK-800 to the RK-1, meant that the M105 engine would be replaced with the then-experimental M106 engine, which had 1,350 horsepower. A prototype for the RK-1 was to be completed by 1940 so it could be shown off and tested by the government. However, unfortunately for the RK-1, Stalin's interest and interference in the project would unintentionally cause its downfall. While Stalin deciding to use the M106 engine was a well-intentioned move done to try and make the best fighter he could imagine, that decision was the main factor that eventually ended the RK-1. Initially, the main issue was that Bakshayev was still technically considered a civilian, and even though the project now had the direct involvement of the Soviet government and Stalin himself, it was still difficult for him to find somebody that would manufacture a prototype or even a mock-up design. This delayed the creation of a mock-up for wind tunnel testing to 1940, the year it was supposed to be completely finished and ready to fly. But still, the wind tunnel testing would prove to be successful, so a full-scale prototype was ordered and was finished by the end of that year. Even with the prototype finished, it was still missing its most crucial component, the engine. While there were plenty of M105 engines available to install in the R1K, the design and request from the government specifically called for the M106. However, the production of the M106 ended up being delayed heavily, because even though it was found to be reliable and easy to install in planes that use the M105, it had significant issues with the cooling system that would unfortunately never be resolved. As a result, the M106 would never make it past the prototype phase, and the M105 remained the aircraft engine of choice for the Soviets up until 1944, when the M107 would be pushed into production. The M107 ended up having significant issues and was very hated by Soviet pilots, but still made it into production regardless, out of necessity. So, with the inevitable failure of the M106, the R1K would never actually receive an engine. An M105 engine was never installed as a substitute for some reason, so it would never take to the skies at all. With the engine being delayed, Bakshayev was then tasked with supervising production of the U-2 trainer planes in the meantime. After the Germans invaded the Soviet Union in mid-1941, experimental projects like the RK-1 were effectively cancelled, as production and resources were diverted to more practical and tried-and-true weapons. Thus, the RK-1 project just kind of fizzled out. Still, even though the RK-1 never took to the air or saw combat, we can still examine it a bit more and try and take a guess at how it would have performed. Hypothetically, with the M106 engine, the Soviet engineers estimated that the top speed would have been 485 miles an hour. If the RK-1 had managed to reach that, it would have made it the fastest propeller plane seen in World War II. However, I do question whether or not it would actually be able to accomplish this. The RK-1 had a listed gross weight of 6,834 pounds, and an engine horsepower of 1,350. We can compare that to the Soviet Yak-9 introduced in late 1942. The Yak-9 had a listed gross weight of 7,064 pounds, and outfitted with the M107 engine, it had 1,650 horsepower. The maximum speed of the Yak-9 was just 430 miles an hour, 
a full 55 miles an hour less than the RK1, despite weighing about the same and having a more powerful engine. Now, with the small high aspect ratio wings that the RK1 would have with the telescopic section fully retracted reduce the drag enough to give it such a speed boost. I do have my doubts about it, but I guess it would be possible, technically. I think the more enticing element, though, would have been the proposed armament for the RK-1. We'll use the Yak-9 again for comparison. The proposed weapons for the RK-1 was two 20mm SHVAK cannons and two 7.62mm SHKAS machine guns. While for a fighter aircraft this may seem a bit lacking, especially if we compare it to something like America's P-47 Thunderbolt and its 850 caliber machine guns, the four total guns of the RK-1 was still quite powerful as far as Soviet fighters went. The listed weapons of the Yak-9, for example, was just one 20mm cannon and two 12.7mm UBS machine guns. The combined power of the two 20mm cannons of the RK-1 would have given it quite a bit of power as far as Soviet aircraft are concerned. The final element of the design that I want to examine is the telescoping wing sections. While these wings were proven to work efficiently in the original project, I think the biggest question would lie in how much space they take up when fully retracted. According to the design, the telescoping section would be able to fully retract into the fuselage and sit flush with the body for aerodynamic purposes. Would the telescoping section sitting in the fuselage reduce the amount of fuel or ammo the plane could carry? It certainly had to displace something of value, so I do wonder what they would have to remove or reduce to have enough room for the telescoping sections. But at this point, who really knows? They never got far enough for us to find any of that stuff out. Considering all the aspects of the RK-1, I do think it could have been a really intriguing fighter for the Soviet Union. I also think, though, that the telescoping aspect would eventually be removed as being a bit pointless in the grand scheme of war. Producing something like that takes extra time and resources, time and resources that could be devoted into making even more planes or other weapons. So my prediction is that if it even made it into production, the telescoping aspect would be removed to help simplify the production and save resources even though I do think the telescoping aspect is very cool and interesting. And so with that, we're going to go ahead and stop for today. Thank you all for watching the video. Of course, remember to like, comment, and subscribe. And I'm kind of surprised that the RK planes aren't talked about a bit more. I think that they're really interesting and cool designs, yet they seem to have been largely forgotten about. I mean, probably because they didn't really accomplish much, but still. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video, I hope you tune in for my next video, and I hope you learned something in this one. So, see ya!